Well, hello, friends, and we are so glad you've joined us for our Sabbath School study. We're in the fourth lesson for 2023, and that is God's mission, my mission. Before we get started, let me introduce our Sabbath School panel, our family here at 3ABN on the Sabbath School panel with me today. To my immediate left is Shelley Quinn. Shelly, glad to have you here. Oh, it's always great to be here. And my lesson is Monday, the God who longs to be with us. Amen. And Ryan Day, to your left. Amen. All right. I have uh, Tuesday's lesson entitled, The God Who Became One With Us. Amen. And Jill Morricone, to your left. Thank you, Pastor James. I'm excited about this quarter. On Wednesday, we look at the God who continues to be with us. Amen. And finally, at the very end, Pastor John Lowe McCain. Yeah, Glad you're here, Pastor. James and John, where the book ends. That's right. That's good. And mine is the God who will come back to us. That's the good news, the blessed Amen. hope. Looking forward to it. Amen. Amen. So we're looking at a Sabbath school lesson this quarter that is all about mission. And we are going to be focusing on that word. In fact, it's going to be in almost every one of the Sabbath school lessons. Mission, 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 except for lesson number 12. So we're going to dive into mission. But before we do that, let's have a word of prayer. Pastor John, would you like to pray for us? Sure. Gracious Father, the loving Lord, we thank you that you've led us all year long in our study of the Sabbath School lesson. As we now begin the fourth quarter, we thank you for the fact that each one of us has been appointed a mission to advance the kingdom, to advance your name, to lead people to know you better. Now, anoint our minds as we study and communicate this word, and may our viewers and listeners be blessed by your presence as we teach. Teach us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God's mission to us, part one. So my name is Pastor James Rafferty, and I have the Sunday Sabbath lesson for this first study in our quarter number four. It's entitled God's mission to us, part one. Next week, we'll do God's mission to us, part two. So God's mission to us, my wife and I were talking about this on the way over and I asked her a question. I kind of had an advantage because I had already looked at the quarterly and I said, honey, who was the first missionary on planet Earth? And she came up with a really good answer. You know, she said, Abraham. And you think about it, you know, because Abraham was the first one probably that was called out of his place of habitation, out of his home. When you think about a missionary, you think of someone who goes somewhere else from where they are. You know, it was right where he was at preaching, you know, the, the coming flood. And we've got Adam and Eve and even Abel and maybe even Enoch that they went out, but then they came back. But Noah went out and he didn't know, or excuse me, Abraham went out and he didn't know where he was going. So my wife said, Abraham, and I said, eh. <laughs> now again, I had the advantage because I'd already seen the quarterly and she kept guessing. Well, uh, Noah, well, uh, Enoch, well, Adam, Adam, Adam. You can't get any more first than Adam, right? And uh, I said, eh, eh, eh. Actually, I told her it was God. And I want you to know, honey, I learned that from the quarterly. I would have been guessing the same things you would have been guessing the whole time. I would have thought, oh, maybe it was Abraham, maybe it was Noah, maybe it was Adam. God was the first missionary. Now, our memory text for this week is Genesis chapter 3, verse 9. Genesis chapter 3, verse 9. So let's just, let's just take a look at that memory text. It says, Then the Lord God called Adam and said unto him, where are you? Where are you? And I love that. We're going we're gonna to start and finish with that for today's lesson. You know, the quarterly goes on to say, mission finds its origin and purpose only in God. This mission did not begin with Abraham's call, Genesis 12, 1 through 4, or with the Exodus, Exodus 12, 31 to 42. It did not begin even with Jesus Christ on earth, Matthew 1, 18 to 25, or with Paul's missionary journeys, Acts 13, 4 through 14. This mission began with God himself Amen. when he bought the, brought the universe into existence and later created humanity. In the scriptures, we see a God who intentionally reaches out and desires to be with his children. From the beginning, he establishes a relationship with Adam and Eve even after sin enters. He continues his mission, but now it is to reestablish his relationship with humankind. I just love that. In the end, God's mission will be accomplished. In the end, yes. the Bible tells us mission accomplished. And we read about that in Revelation chapters 21 and 22, probably the most beautiful chapters in the Bible. 
which is why we should be motivated in the work of proclaiming the everlasting or eternal gospel to the world. Revelation 14, 6 and 7. The quarterly goes on to say, the foundation of any mission endeavor, therefore, must be centered in a relationship with the Creator and with a proper understanding of His missionary nature and character. Before we understand the mission of God, it is essential to better understand the God of the mission. Love that introduction to our quarter in Sabbath's lesson. Now we're going to go to Sunday's lesson, the God who reaches out to us. You know, when you think about all of this, this is a quarter that we're going to be studying this theme of mission and outreach. And we're not studying the book of Ephesians, you know, we're not studying the book of Hebrews and, you know, all of these intellectually challenging and, and insightful, you know, uh, nuggets into the Word of God. We're studying a the theme. And sometimes when you study a theme, you can think, ah, it's not as interesting as learning about a certain book or whatever. But when I started looking at this theme and this introduction to this theme, I thought of all the things that we could study in the Bible, this takes in everything. And it really is something that we need to focus on, perhaps something that we've neglected to focus on as we should, because this is really what it's all about. All the knowledge we get from the books of the Bible in the New and the Old Testament, all of that is leading us to two things, basically, and that is to understand God and to understand His mission Amen. so that we can be part of the mission of God in reaching out to the world with the everlasting gospel. The God who reaches out to us. The quarterly goes on to say, God created us in His image and likeness. He gave us a perfect world and His purpose was that we would live in perfect connection with Him, a relationship centered in His most precious attribute, love. But for love to be real, God also gave us another precious gift, free will the freedom to choose which way to follow. And of course, God gave clear instructions to Adam and Eve about the danger and deadly consequences of disobedience. Genesis 2, 16 and 17. Satan, in turn, deceptively persuaded Eve that she could eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but without any negative results. On the contrary, he claimed that they would be like God, knowing good and evil. Genesis chapter 3, verse 5. Unfortunately, Eve chose to eat and gave the fruit to Adam, and made, who made the same choice, and the perfect creation was then stained by sin. So what was God going to do? His mission was spoiled, mission aborted, so to speak, right? Creating a perfect world without sin, a perfect world that would adore the Creator and live without pain and suffering and death. The moment that moment changed God's original plan and purpose for the newly created planet. The mission of salvation, which had been designed before the foundation of the world, and they quote Ephesians 1, 4, but if I was reading this as Shelley, I would quote Revelation 13, verse 8, yes. <laughs> had now to be implemented, right? So we read Genesis chapter 3, 19 through 15. And as you read Genesis 3, 19 through 15, you're going to find that we, uh, God's first words to Adam and Eve after Eve and then Adam fell. What were God's first words to them after they fell and why is that statement so significant theologically for us today? The first words were, where art thou? Where are you? And that implies that God is looking for us, yes. right? It's not that He doesn't know where we are. He knows where every one of us are. He knows where we are and what we're about and the struggles we're going through and the questions that we have. He knows all of that, but he is asking the question so that we can become aware, self-aware, aware of ourselves and our situation, our circumstance, where we've fallen to, where we've fallen from. All of that information, all of that understanding is the purpose of God through His Word, through the Bible, through the Holy Spirit. God is instructing us and helping us to understand where we came from, what our destiny is, and where we are right now. Of course, God knew exactly where they were. The quarterly goes on to say, dominated by fear, Adam and Eve were the ones who needed to see what was going on. But they also needed to be confronted so they could understand the dreadful consequences of their sin. Satan also needed to be defeated. For that, God then began to present His mission, the plan of redemption, Genesis 3, 14 and 15. The only hope of reconciling the world to Himself, 2 Corinthians 5, 19. So 
We need to pay close attention now, however, to the fact that before the confrontation and the promise of reconciliation, God came looking for fallen humankind. In spite of the seemingly hopeless situation, God essentially addresses two issues in his question to Adam, our fallen state and his missionary nature our fallen state and his missionary nature. Mm -hmm. So Adam and Eve are becoming aware of the fact that something's changed. Every single day they'd come to the garden and they would meet with, with God in the cool of the evening. They would talk about their day and the things that they learned and the amazing stuff that was going on. It's kind of like, you know, Reese and I, after the day is over, you know, we get together and we're talking about the watermelons, these big watermelons growing over this cage in the garden and the cantaloupe, all the amazing cantaloupe. And of course, last year we didn't get watermelon or cantaloupe or zucchini, so to speak, because the ground squirrels came and they just, they just completely obliterated our garden. But this year, there's no ground squirrels to, to speak of. And we've got watermelon hanging, and we've got to put them in these little baggies. You know, we've got cantaloupe hanging. We've got to put them in baggies. And cucumbers are already cutting those up and eating those. And tomatoes, all oh, the tomatoes are amazing. I don't even like tomatoes. But tomatoes from the garden, oh, they are just a completely different animal, right? So Adam and Eve are talking to God about all the things they're discovering. And in the cool of the day, and then one one day God shows up and they're not there. And Adam and Eve, hiding in fear, need to realize what's happened. You see, they can think in their minds that God has changed toward them, but the Bible says God doesn't change. That's right. And so what God needs to awaken in their minds is the fact that they've changed toward God, mm -hmm. that they've been filled with a fear of God that they didn't have before they sinned. And that's what sin does to us, friends. Sin actually causes us to be fearful of God in a way that is not biblical. Now, there is a fear of God that we need to have, and that is a fear that leads us away from sin. And we read about that in Genesis chapter 20, verse 20. But there's another fear that leads us away from God, that leads us to be afraid of God, God who was our creator and now our savior. And so God comes on his first mission, his first mission adventure, his first Maranatha trip, so to speak. And he's coming to the Garden of Eden. He's coming to us. And when we see this picture of God, it causes us to realize not only that he is a missionary at heart, but to be recreated in his image, to be restored to the image in which we were created, we will become missionaries. Mm -hmm. And to be a missionary for God is to be reunited to the original purpose, to the purpose that God created us to experience. So throughout history, God continues to ask, where are you? In your personal experience, what does this mean for you? How have you answered him? What is your response when God says, where are you? Where are you in your relationship with him? And where are you in your missionary endeavors, united with him to reach the world with this incredible message of his eternal love for each one of us? Amen. Amen. Thank you, James, for that beautiful introduction. I'm Shelley Quinn, and I have Monday's lesson the God who longs to be with us, the God who longs to be with you. I want to read a sentence from the study guide. It says, in the Old Testament narrative, God continues to act according to his missionary nature in order to fulfill his purposes. And I just, want, I love this because the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is really a single narrative and God does not change. He is the same God of love in the Old Testament that he is in the New. But God is holy. Do you know what that means? That word means he's sanctified, he's set apart from sin. God is morally perfect and his mission is to restore righteousness in humanity because he created us for fellowship. Now we can't come into fellowship with him as unrighteous beings, mm -hmm. but he wants this intimate fellowship with us. He longs to be with us. I, I just stop and, and say those words. Mm -hmm. God longs mm -hmm. to be with mm -hmm. me, mm -hmm. with you. The only way to reconcile the relationship. As we said in Genesis 3.15, he introduces the coming Messiah. Mm -hmm. Righteousness by faith is the only way that we will be restored by God. Mm -hmm. It's his work. So Genesis 
12, 1 through 3, we see this Abraham, the missionary. God calls him to his missionary to be his God's missionary channel. He says, Abraham, I'm going to use you as a channel to fulfill my missionary purposes of blessing all nations. And listen to what he says to him. In you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God never intended for it to be Israelites only. He intended his salvation, his rescue mission to include all people. Amen. So I love what Paul says in Romans 4:11. Abraham is the father of all who believe. Mm. I, you know, think about that. We don't run around saying, oh, our father Abraham, but we could. Maybe we should. He is our father. Mm -hmm. So Genesis 17, 1 through 8, what happens? God brings five great I will promises together mm -hmm. to express his will for the everlasting covenant that he introduced in the garden, the coming Messiah. Anytime you see the words I will, that is the covenant language of a covenant making covenant keeping God. Mm -hmm. And he says in Genesis 17, 7, I will, he's speaking to Abraham, establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you and their generations for an everlasting God. Remember, mm -hmm. Abraham's the father of us all. And here's his purpose. It's an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. God wants to be your Abba Father. And you know what? I will be there, God. You will be my people. I will be with you. Becomes God's ringing proclamation throughout the rest of the Bible. In Genesis 26, verse 3, God's renewing the covenant with Isaac. Listen, he says, dwell in this land. I will be with you. I will bless you. Then when he renews the covenant with Jacob in Genesis 28, 15, God says, behold, wake up. Listen, I am with you. I will keep you wherever you go. I'll bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I've done what I've spoken to you. And then we go on from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob. Then we come to Joseph. God's chosen prince. And you know, it's interesting. God was with Joseph throughout all of his darkest hours. Mm -hmm. Joseph was sold into slavery in Potter's house. Listen to Genesis 39, 2 through 3. The Lord mm -hmm. was with Joseph. He was a successful man. And his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. Guess what? Joseph gets thrown into prison. Mm -hmm. False charges. Two years. But listen to Genesis 39, 21 through 23. The Lord was with him even in mm -hmm. prison. It says, verse Genesis 39, 21, the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison and the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hands all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever they did there, it was his, Joseph's doing. The keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority. Why? Because the Lord was with him and whatever he did, mm. the Lord made mm -hmm. it prosper. So I love Genesis 45 when the brothers, Joseph finally reveals himself mm -hmm. to his brothers who had sold him into slavery. And you know what? Joseph was spiritually mature enough to realize it was God's providence. Mm -hmm. Listen what he says. Genesis 45, 4 through 8. Three times he says this to his brothers. God sent me before you to preserve life. Ha, huh, you think you sent me down to Egypt? Nope, it was God's providence that I come here. And then verse 7, and God 
sent me before you to preserve a posterity. That, that's the same word for remnant. Mm -hmm. For you in the earth to save your lives by a great deliverance. And verse 8, so now it was not you who sent me here, but God. Right. So mm -hmm. God's covenant blessings were always on faithful Joseph. Yes. He took him from a pit to a prison, and then he took him to the palace of Egypt with a plan that would save the remnant of God's covenant people on earth during a time of great drought and starvation. So when bad things happen to us, listen to what I'm saying. If you're going through something bad right now, just say, Lord, I thank you that you're still with me. Maybe it's your providence that I'm going through this. You're going to work all things together for my eternal benefit. Teach me what I need to know. Now in Exodus 3, 12, I've got to hurry. Generations later, God called Moses. He commissioned him to be a missionary to deliver his people out of bondage. And God said to him in Genesis, Exodus 3, 12, I will certainly be with you. Mm -hmm. Time after time, Yahweh, the covenant God, confirmed his deep desire to be with his people. In Exodus 25, 8, he says, let them build me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Mm -hmm. This is God's heart. Mm -hmm. He said in Exodus 29, 43 and 45, there in the sanctuary, I will meet with the children of Israel and the taber tabernacle shall be sanctified by my glory. I'll dwell among the children of Israel and I will be their God. Mm -hmm. What about today? God still wants to dwell among us. He wants to dwell in us. Right. Jesus said in John 14, 23, if anyone loves me, he'll keep my word. My father will love him. We will come to them and make our home with them. You know, Ephesians 3, 16 and 17 tells us that Christ dwells in our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit. So does the Father. And once again, this idea of God being our God and being with us is echoed in 2 Corinthians 6, 16. He says, Paul says, he's quoting, I will dwell in them. I will walk among them. I will be their God. They shall be my people. That's what he says in Hebrews 8, 10. I'm going to put my laws in your heart. Mm -hmm. I will be your God. You will be my people. And in Matthew 28, 20, in the Great Commission, Christ sends us out on this mission. And he says, teach everybody to observe all things that I've commanded you. And then what does he say? Amen. Lo, I will be with you always. Amen. Even at the very end. Praise God. Praise God for his mission that can be our mission. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could watch a 3 ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Hello, friends, and welcome back to God's Mission, My Mission. We're turning the time over to evangelist singer Ryan Day. Thank you so much, Pastor James. Thank you, Shelley, for such a great foundation that has been set. I'm Ryan Day. I do have Tuesday's lesson entitled, The God Who Became One With Us. And as we have learned, uh, God is the greatest missionary. He was the original missionary. And everything we see in Scripture from Genesis to Revelation uh, is being done by God according to His missionary strategy. There is nothing that we read about or that we see in the Bible that is not according to God's missionary strategy in the hopes of reaching man uh, for the greater good, in hopes of drawing man to Him. And so we actually see this very clearly brought out by God Himself in Isaiah chapter 46, verses 9 and 10. Again, Isaiah chapter 
chapter 46, verses 9 and 10, that famous uh, verse where we hear God sing, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none like me, or no other. Uh, he says, I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things that are not done yet, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Mm. So God says, look, I've, I, we've heard the little song. What's that little song we've got? He's got the whole world in his hands. Well, that's, that, goes, that goes far and beyond just that simple childlike meaning. Uh, God is in control. You just go to the back of the book, you see that he wins. So there's nothing that is not allowed or that is not done that is not according to God's missionary strategy. And that is basically what Tuesday's lesson is bringing out. That's what these previous lessons have shown us as well. And I'm sure we're going to continue to see that as we go through. Uh, but as we see here, God has desired to constantly be with us. When Adam and Eve was literally physically separated from God in the Garden of Eden because of the introduction of sin, uh, you cannot, you, we cannot begin to imagine how much that broke God's heart yeah. because it's always been God's mission. It's always been His purpose. We see that all the way to the book of Revelation when God's people at the end of time are united with Him. And it says, and God shall be with men and men shall be their God. We're in the very presence of God. That's his ultimate purpose is that his cre creation, his children are one with him, are in his very presence. And so because the appointed time had not come for God himself, and that's where we're gravitating towards this point in which we see God be literally becoming one with man in the flesh through the incarnate Jesus Christ. We're not quite there just yet. We're getting there. But it, because of that appointed time had not come just yet, God finds ways. He, we see ways in scripture in which he he brings himself closer and closer to dwell with men. Right there in Exodus chapter 25 and verse 8, what do we find? And God says to Moses, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Again, God desiring to be with man because the closer he's with man, the more involved he is with man, the more he can carry out that missionary strategy and that missionary purpose. But it's interesting that while God was only able to access men through the sanctuary and through the process and the, and the redemptive plan that he laid out through the sanctuary and wanting to be close to them in order to share forth his, his grace and his love and his character, we see that uh, Israel, it was, it was God's desire that this plan of redemption, this grace, this compassion, the character of God uh, and God being close to them and being with them was to be carried out through Israel as a people. But it's interesting because you keep reading to Ezekiel and I'm not going to take time to read the passage. Passage. But if you go to Ezekiel chapter 11, we see that plan ultimately, uh, I wouldn't say backfire because God's plan never backfires, but ultimately Israel made the decision to reject God, to reject God, to reject God. We see this over and over to the point that God was evicted from his own house, basically. Mm. He had to leave because Israel chose to worship other gods. So we see him leave and we find that he, he leaves for a moment. Israel falls into 70 years of captivity. Uh, and, and of course, this was, of course, according to God's plan and purpose to try to to win back Israel and give them another chance. And we see right there in Daniel 9, 25, God's still desiring to be right. with men because even when they've been through the 70 years of Babylonian captivity and hoping God can wake them up to, so that they can see their need of him and that God can also once more dwell with his people, he tells them, he says, I'm going to give you another chance, but it's all going to come down to a moment. Get this. It's all going to come down to a moment in which I, God, mm -hmm. I'm going to send my son and it says right there in Daniel chapter 9, 25, it says, uh, uh, it says basically that the, uh, from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince shall come. Mm. Now, what happens in Matthew chapter 1? That fulfillment comes, comes to pass. Mm -hmm. We see right there in Matthew chapter 1, this idea of God dwelling with us takes on another, just a whole nother level because not only is God dwelling with us, but he has become one with us. At this point, since uh, Genesis, since Genesis 3, God has been among us. He's dwelt among us, uh, but in spiritual form with the veil of the temple. But now God is going to be, he's going to take on the flesh of man. And we see the promise of that in Matthew chapter one, verses 20 through 23. I'm not going to read all of it, but uh, well, let's start with, with Matthew chapter one, verses 20. It says, but while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him. This is speaking of Joseph, the father of Christ, the earthly father of Christ, receiving the vision and the message from God in a dream. It says saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take 
to you, your, Mary, to your wife or to be your wife, for that which is conceived of her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. But how is he going to do that? How is he going to carry out that missionary work of saving his people from their sins? Right down here, notice. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord through the prophet saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and bear a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel. And what is that prophetic meaning of that name, which is translated God with us, not just among us. Now he's with us. He's taken on a whole other form. He has become man. And we see this also carried out very clearly in the mission of what Christ was to do when he took on flesh. John chapter one, beautiful words. It's one of my favorite texts because John chapter one reveals to us that what is Christ? What is God's plan? What is his missionary and redemptive plan by clothing the Son of God in flesh and making him or, or causing him to dwell among men as one of them. We see it right here in John chapter 1, verses 14 through 18. Again, everything is done according to his missionary strategy and purpose. It says, And the Word became flesh. This is verse 14. He became flesh and he dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. I love that passage in Haggai. Haggai, I believe it is chapter two, where it says that, uh, you know, behold the former things of old. And it talks about how the desire of nations shall come. And it says that the former glory shall not be as great as this latter glory, speaking of the latter temple that was destroyed, Solomon's temple. But yet this, this latter glory will be greater than the former. And if you catch that picture in your mind, even many, many Jewish people today, Jewish scholars, they scratch their head when they read that passage, because again, they don't believe in the Messiah. They don't believe Jesus was the Messiah. But you Yet he was the fulfillment of that passage because the glory of God entered that temple in no way that they ever could imagine. Not in some spiritual pillar of cloud that lit up and with thunders and lightnings and all that. He literally came in flesh, in human flesh, to show and to teach man exactly the ways of God. In fact, notice what it says here. It says, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out saying, this was he whom I said, he who comes after me is preferred before me for he was before me. I love that. He, he's going to come after me, but don't make any mistake. He was way before me. Mm -hmm. And then he goes on to say, and of his fullness, we have all received and grace for grace for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one Amen. has seen God at any time. The only begotten son who is in the bosom of the father, he has declared him. So the only way the only way that the gospel could become fully manifest in the hearts of man according to the full purpose that God had prepared for us to understand grace and mercy and the fullness of truth and to understand the fullness of his character, it had to come in the flesh, in a man who was, yes, fully man, but 100% fully divine yeah. in the person of Jesus Christ. No longer God just dwelling among us, which we certainly need that, but now God becoming one with us. And the lesson brings out, it says, God moved forward with his mission and then through Jesus Christ was present in the flesh among his children. The one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth, fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies and in a accordance with the divine plan became one with us. God in human flesh. Wrap your mind around that. You can't. You can't understand that. I can't understand that. How can God become man? It's a mystery, but it's needed. It's necessary. And we're not here if it doesn't happen. The God of mission was continuing to accomplish his purpose. And so I don't know where you are around the world right now listening to this message, but, you know, when you say your prayers, uh, lift up a praise to the Lord and say, God, thank you. Thank you for sending yourself. Thank you, God, for taking on flesh and coming down and not just dwelling among us, but becoming one of us mm -hmm. that we might be one with you. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Ryan. What a powerful lesson. I love your energy and enthusiasm. Thank you. And Pastor James and Shelley, what an incredible lesson. As Pastor James already referenced, we're not studying a book. We're studying the theme of mission. 
What an incredible theme. I'm looking forward to this quarter and this time of study we have together. Incidentally, this quarter written by Global Mission from the General Conference, and I think of Gary Krauss. He's <laughs> been coming here for many years, mm -hmm. two, three ABN, um, Homer Tricartan, Jeff Scoggins, and others, of course, putting it together. But what an incredible study of mission. I'm Jill Morricone. On Wednesday, we look at the God who continues to be with us. Mm -hmm. And as Pastor James and Shelley and Ryan set up so beautifully, God's desire is that we would be in relationship with Him. Sin brought that separation from God. So God sent His Son, Jesus, that you and I could be reconciled back to the Father. That's right. On Wednesday's lesson, we're going to look at seven snapshots, okay. Pastor John, seven snapshots of the reconciliation ministry of Christ's life, death, and resurrection. So let's take a look at that, the God who continues to be with us. Snapshot number one, for that we're going, the verse for that, we're going to John 3, 16. And you might know this verse, so maybe quote it with me at home. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I love that. Snapshot number one, reconciliation comes from God. So many times we think it comes from Jesus and Jesus loves us and Jesus wants relationship with us. But the God of the Old Testament is a little harsh and a little stern. No, it was in God's heart. God so loved you and me. He loved the world that he gave his son. He orchestrated in conjunction, of course, with God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, but orchestrated the plan of redemption. This reconciliation, John 16, 27, I love this scripture. It says the Father himself loves you. Mm -hmm. Snapshot Amen. number one, reconciliation comes from God. Right. Snapshot number two, for this uh, verse, we're going to John 14. John 14, we're going to look at verses 8 and 9. Mm. Philip's talking. He said, show us the Father. And what does Jesus answer? Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Snapshot number two, reconciliation was revealed in the life of Jesus. Mm -hmm. His life from the cradle to the cross That's revealed right. the character of the Father. His mission on earth was to reveal that perfect character, live a perfect life. Let's go to snapshot number three. For that, we're going to Luke 19, verse 10. Luke 19, 10. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save mm -hmm. that which was lost. That's right. Snapshot number three, reconciliation was the mission of Jesus. That's why he came. Hmm. That's why he was born as a baby. As Ryan brought out the incarnation, 100% fully human, fully divine. I do not understand that. But that's why he came, was to reconcile us back to God. His mission was to seek and to save you and me those who were lost. Let's go to snapshot four. For this, we're going to Romans five. Romans chapter five, we're gonna look at verse 10. Romans five ten. For if when we were enemies, mm -hmm. when we were estranged, you've been estranged from God? Sin mm -hmm. brought estrangement. Sin brought separation. If when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God, how? Through the death of of his son. Much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Snapshot number four, reconciliation with God occurs because of the cross. Jesus' death on the cross, his substitutionary death ensured opportunity was given to all to make that choice Yes, I want to accept Jesus. Yes, I want to be justified. Yes, I want to be reconciled back to God. Right. Opportunity was given at the cross for you and I to make that choice, to accept Jesus. Perfect righteousness, as Shelley brought out, his 
substitutionary life, the blood of Jesus covering me. And at that moment, we can stand before God as if we have never sinned. I remember one time after I was speaking, an elderly gentleman came up to me and he said, if I could only know, if I could only know that Jesus forgave me. Hmm. And I said to him, have you asked for his forgiveness? And he said, every day. Hmm. Oh. I've asked every single day. Mm. And I still don't know if he can forgive mm. me. Jesus' mm. death on the cross is not dependent on how you feel. Mm. It's dependent on the blood of Jesus and you accepting by faith right. his sacrifice in your yeah. place. It's 2 Corinthians 5, 21, Shelley. He made him, God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Right. So God took my sin and in exchange, he gave me the righteousness Amen. of Jesus. Amen. Right. We're going to snapshot number five. The verse for this is Ephesians. Ephesians 2 verse 13. Once we are reconciled back to God, you and I can then be reconciled to each other. Ephesians 2, 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Right. Snapshot number five, reconciliation with others occurs because of the cross. We can't be reconciled to our brothers and sisters without first being vertically reconciled to God. And then only the cross, only Jesus enables us to forgive each other to live in harmony with each other, to work together. We keep going, Ephesians 2, 16, that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. In place of hostility is reconciliation. Now this, in this time, is talking specifically of the Jews and the Gentiles. But it could apply to any people group, any caste, any religion. God can reconcile people. Once we're reconciled to him, that is important. Then we can be reconciled to each other. We're going to right. snapshot number six. We're in Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2 verses 4 through 6. But God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Snapshot number 6. Reconciliation with God involves the eradication of sin in the life of the believer. We were once dead in trespasses and sins. We once walked in the ways of the world, but God through Jesus can eradicate that sin from our lives. Amen. He can sanctify us by the washing of the water, the word and the power of his Holy Spirit. And finally, snapshot number seven. We're going to 2 Corinthians 5 verses 18 through 20 for this snapshot. All things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us the ministry of reconciliation. Now then, you are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through you, be reconciled to God. Snapshot number seven, reconciled people reconcile. In yeah. other words, once you are reconciled to Jesus and then he reconciles you to those you work with and those you connect with, he calls you to be his reconciling agent. He calls you to be involved in mission. He calls you to be his ambassador. That is the great commission after all. Matthew 28, 18 through 20, what does it say? Go ye into all the world. So to recap, reconciliation comes from God. It was revealed in the life of Jesus. It was the mission of Jesus. It occurs because of the cross. Reconciliation with God occurs because of the cross and reconciliation with others occurs because of the cross. It involves the eradication of sin in the life and reconciled people are involved in the ministry of reconciliation. Thank you, Jill, so much. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Shelley. Thank you, James. Mm -hmm. 
it's amazing. Thursday is the gleaning day where we get a chance to hear how the lesson unfolds and I'm excited about my title, The God Who Will Come Back to Us. The foundations were beautifully laid and I won't call them all foundations, but James laid the foundation and we've been building on every, every one of the floors in the context of the sanctuary language, which we find that language continues in the New Testament. The writer of the lesson or the group that wrote the lesson started with this phrase on Thursday. During his earthly ministry, one of Christ's most precious promises, the blessed hope reflects once again the Creator's desire to be with us for eternity. You know, Jesus affirms the completion of the plan of salvation with the sanctuary language again, Shelley, I will. And I love that phrase. And we go to John 14, looking at the continuation of the sanctuary picture through the life of Christ. This covenant language, the phrase, I will. Notice John 14, verses 1 to 3. He begins, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. Every time I see that phrase, I always say, I don't need a mansion. Just give me a sleeping bag. I'll be happy to be in heaven. <laughs> in my Father's house are many mansions. That's his great love for us. The actual Greek is dwelling places, a place that he's gone to prepare for us. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, here's the language, I will come yeah. again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Now, this is an interesting phrase, I will, because, because of the fact that Satan was acquainted with the sanctuary, mm -hmm. he tried to counterfeit mm -hmm. the sanctuary promise of God with his own five I will declarations in Isaiah 14, verses 13 and 14. Right. And he ended it by saying, I will be like the Most mm -hmm. High. Mm -hmm. And in the closing out of God's completion of his sanctuary promise, Satan will try to close it out with his own counterfeit promise that he stole from the sanctuary commitment that God made to us. Mm. I will be like the Most High. That's going to be the personation of Christ. As Jesus is preparing to complete his promise of being with us, mm. Satan counterfeits that promise by personating the person of Christ by I will be like the Most High. But thank the Lord, his promise is supreme. As Ryan stated in Isaiah 46, verse 9 and 10, I will do all my pleasure. Right. God's promise is much greater. You see what the lesson brings out in the question, in what ways is the promise connected with the end time message found in the scriptures? And I find two things. And by the way, I have five points that I bring out, Jill. Okay. I'll just share in a moment here. But one, we find the promise of God is true. Second one, I will come again, is an assurance that Jesus will return to take us to heaven. Mm -hmm. I, I talked about this not too long ago, but you know, we receive an inheritance, but we are also God's inheritance. And you alluded to that. When the Lord sent Jesus, he didn't just send Jesus to complete the plan of salvation to, to uh, eradicate sin. He sent him to get us back home. Uh -huh. He sent him to bring us back as God's inheritance. And so you find this, this plan working itself out in the book of Acts. We go to Acts chapter 1, verse 11. Uh, the Lord included in this the urgency of that covenant promise. In other words, you've got to do something for this promise to be fulfilled. Acts 1, verse 11. Who also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Mm -hmm. So according to John, John made the declaration, but the doc, Dr. Luke continues to say to us, the promise will become a reality. The same God that left, the same Jesus that left, will come in the same way that he left. And so John, now in Revelation chapter 21, verses 3, records the fulfillment of the covenant promise that God made to us. Notice Revelation chapter 21. And I want you to notice the word will. It continually is repeated to remind us of that promise, that initial promise. Revelation 21, 3. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle or dwelling place of God is with men. Mm -hmm. And here it is. He will 
dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. And I love the way that the Desire of Ages brings this out on page 26. The work of redemption will be complete. In the place where sin abounded, God's grace much more abounds. The earth itself, the very field that Satan claims as his, is to be not only ransomed, but exalted. Here where the Son of God tabernacled with humanity, where the King of glory lived and suffered and died. Here, when he shall make all things new, the tabernacle of God shall be with men. Amen. That is on this earth and through endless ages as the redeemed walk in the light of the Lord, they will praise him for his unspeakable gift, Emmanuel, which is saying what? God with us. What a fulfillment. So here are the five things that the accomplishment that the return of Jesus will accomplish, my five points. Go to Revelation 21, verse 4. Here's the first one. The eradication of the conditions associated with sin. Jill, read verse 4 for us, if you will. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There should be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. So the return of Jesus will eradicate every condition associated with sin. But then also, Nahum 1, 9, the second thing it will accomplish is the annihilation of sin. Nahum 1, 9, why do you conspire or what do you conspire against the Lord? He will make an utter end of it. Affliction will not rise up a second time. Mm -hmm. Amen for that? Mm -hmm. All of this that we're facing now, all the difficulty, all the disappointments will not repeat itself again in eternity. The third one, Matthew 25, verse 34, the third thing that it will accomplish is the reception of the inheritance of our eternal kingdom. Mm -hmm. How beautiful this is. Matthew 25, 34. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now, I said this a moment ago, our inheritance is the kingdom, but we are God's inheritance. You know, you find in 1 Corinthians 15 where, where Paul talks about then then Jesus will deliver the kingdom to the Father. And he's not delivering a, just a place, he's delivering the inheritance. That's every one of us. I'm looking forward to being in that inheritance. Amen. What about you? Amen. The fourth thing that will be accomplished by the return of Jesus is in Revelation 22 and verse four. And I love this part. Because of sin, we have not had this privilege, mm -hmm. but we will have this privilege when God's plan is completed. Revelation 22 verse four, they shall see his face mm -hmm. and his name shall be on their foreheads. Now, God's not going to hit a stamp on our forehead. We're going to walk around with a name, but that means in our mind, the only name that will continue to resonate throughout eternity is the name Jesus mm -hmm. will be on our foreheads. We will be sealed in that wonderful promise that he is our eternal redeemer. And the fifth thing that the return of Jesus will accomplish is Revelation 21 verse five. Let's look at that the eradication of all things. You have that, Ryan? You want yes, to read I that? Yes, I do. One of my okay. favorite texts. Uh, then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. You see, what's wonderful about that promise is the sanctuary that we talked about earlier, that he said, Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them, will be accomplished in that verse. Isaiah, I mean, uh, Exodus 25, verse 9, Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. And then he talked about that. We will see his face, he will be with us, mm -hmm. we will be with him. That earthly sanctuary was a forecast of the glorious fulfillment that we will be with God and tabernacle with him and he will tabernacle with us. That's why Revelation 21 verse three is so significant. Notice what it says. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them. They shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God and finally, the return of Jesus will usher in the final phase of the plan of redemption, Isaiah 25 and verse 9. I always love this. You see, we are saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved, mm -hmm. Isaiah 25 and verse 9. And it will be said in that day, and I believe I'll be among those to say this, behold, this is our God. We have waited for him, and here it is, Shelley, he will save, save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. 
we will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. I'm looking forward to that glorious mm. fulfillment. Amen. 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 We've just got a few more minutes now to do for some closing thoughts. I just want you to remember that God longs to be with you. If you are his child, he's with you always. Mm. If you're not his child, he's there and he wants to come into your heart. He stands at the door and knocks, let him in. Amen. Mm. Amen. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. God is a mission-minded person. He's a mission-minded individual, and that's what we're learning uh, starting this week and throughout the next 13 weeks together. We're going to learn just how mission-minded God really is. Mm -hmm. I'm just so blessed, even at the beginning of this quarter, as we're reminded we have a God who loves us, a God who wants to be in relationship with us. Mm -hmm. He has done everything that He can that we can be reunited with Him and the choice is ours. Do we want to accept that or not? That's right. And the God who will come back to us wants us first to come back to Him. And I love Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 7. Today, if you will hear His voice. Today, you can make that decision. You can make that declaration that I want to be in that number. I want to be in that redeemed host. I want to be there when those words of Isaiah are being fulfilled. I want to tabernacle with God throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. Today, if you will hear His voice, harden not your heart. This is your privilege. This is your opportunity. This is the day that the door is being opened and everyone who accepts the Christ who will come back to take us as an inheritance to his Father can have that blessing. Today mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. that day. Amen. Amen, amen. Thank you, John. Thank you, Jill. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Shelly. Shelly, your emphasis I loved. God is on a mission to restore us in spite of our most difficult situations. And Ryan, God becomes a missionary, not just to us, but among us, mm -hmm. as us. And then Jill, the Father has the heart of mission, the heart of reconciliation. And John, God will complete his mission for us. That's right. Praise God, praise God. A great start to our Sabbath school lesson for quarter number four, 2023, which is entitled, God's Mission, My Mission. And we just studied the first lesson, which was entitled God's Mission to Us, Part 1. Next time, next week, we're going to be studying the second lesson, which is entitled God's Mission to Us, Part 2. And we've learned that God is a missionary, that His heart has the heart of a missionary. And when we accept Christ as our Savior, He gives us His, his heart and we become missionaries to other, others. Looking forward to continuing this study in our quarter number four. God bless you until then.